This YouTube live stuff is so confusing at times. <laughs> I've definitely had my frustrations with it in the past. <laughs> All right, we are about to go live. Oh, nice. What is up, you guys? Oh, snap, we're live already? Yeah, I just saw it. I got a second screen open, so. Okay, let's just, let me confirm right now. Okay, it says, is live. Oh, we are live. What is going on, everybody? I got a screen. There you go. I see it now. It's popping up. What's going on, everybody? Hello, and welcome to the first live stream. This is the first live stream of Kicking It With Kerem. And today we have a special guest for you who's going to be discussing real estate with us. Welcome, Matt, to the channel. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited, especially to be the inaugural guest. That's, uh, that's a very <laughs> great honor. You're the number one guest on the channel for the first live stream. And it's exciting because I've watched a lot of the work that you do, a lot of the things you do. And you just finished up with OREC, a uh, real estate meetup in London. And that was just amazing. So I said, I have to be able to grab you to get you to the audience to kind of share with them your take on the things that you do. So we're glad to have you, Matt. So as we continue right now and speak, I want to have the audience kind of get a feel for who you are. So can you give us a basic overview of who you are, what you do, and what are you involved in? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, my name is Matt McKeever. And so uh, always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit and always constantly had little side hustles going. You know, growing up, I grew up on a farm. So we grow pumpkins and sell them at uh, Halloween time, that sort of thing. Yeah. Started a football field when I was... Uh, I think around 15, 16. And then uh, when I was in third year university, we had like a skateboard and t-shirt shop uh, and essentially just always been trying to do something. Started like an import export business for a little bit in university as well, trying to import blank CDs from China. So essentially went to school to be a CPA, did that. Uh, the reason I kind of became a CPA, and this will probably ring true with your audience as well, was because my parents told me to go get a good, safe job and being a CPA was a good, safe job in their opinion. Uh, it worked out well for me because I did always have that entrepreneurial spirit. So being a CPA gave me just the opportunity to check out a ton of different businesses and investors because I started doing their taxes. So I got exposed wow. to essentially everything that they were doing. And I got to see who's actually successful and who's pretending to be successful because some of the people in your local community they maybe drive fancy cars, but I would see what they were making. And other people would drive shitty old beat up cars. And I also saw that. <laughs> that is crazy. So you're basically saying that you were inside the finances of these people who were driving those nice cars, but realistically had no money, correct? Yeah. So if you're familiar with the book, uh, The Millionaire Next Door, written by Dr. Stanley, essentially, I literally got to experience that as a tax preparer because I saw, you know, a lot of people that would come in would they'd be dressed down, not, no flash, nothing fancy, but they had tons of money, tons of investments and you know, huge rental property portfolios. And so in my uh, third, fourth year university, a friend put me onto the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was kind of my gateway drug into real estate investing. And from there, I just became obsessed about real estate investing, got into the game at 25, bought a property a year for essentially three or four years, took a year or two off to save up some more money. Yeah. Then, uh, in 2016, at the age of 31, quit my full-time day job to do real estate investing full-time and essentially just been kind of goofing around on YouTube uh, ever since. And your day job was uh, being a CPA, correct? Yeah. So I worked as a CPA. So I did five years in public accounting working for BDO and that was here in London, Ontario in Canada. Then essentially what happened was I had four or five mortgages at that point. And the bank told wow. me I need to go get a better job in order to qualify for more mortgages. So I joined um, a pharmaceutical team here in London, Ontario, became the sole financial controller. And essentially it was 2016. So it was the heyday of the pharmaceutical industry. So literally there was a tweet. Uh, it was during the American election. There was a tweet Hillary Clinton put out about the pharmaceutical industry that destroyed our market cap. It was such a crazy volatile time. Um, and yeah. that volatility kind of showed me I was on our acquisition team. So when we'd go in and acquire a company, I'd be one of the guys that would come in and we would sit down and, you know, interface with them, try and learn their job. And eventually, usually with acquisitions, you're looking for synergies. Right. So then you reduce yeah. the, the head count or the overhead. And so it was really funny that 
I'd been on the one side of the table, you know, telling the person that, you know, oh, we're all a team. We're not sure what's going to happen, but you just got to, you know, pitch in and hopefully things work out. And then shortly after that, we got acquired. And all of a sudden I was on the opposite side of it. And there was a consultant across the table from me telling me, oh, don't worry, you're part of the team. And essentially, I was like, man, I've been here. I've done that. Uh, I've been on the other side. I know what you guys are doing. I'm not going to fall for it. And I essentially <laughs> negotiated a large retention bonus, then tried to re negotiate a second retention bonus after that first one was up. We didn't see eye to eye. And uh, I essentially, at that point in time, I was financially free, financially independent because of my real estate investing. So I just pieced out. That is crazy. So at the age of 31, you said you completely stopped working in that CPA, yeah. business, right? That CPA job. Exactly. And as you were, as you were doing your CPA work, you had five mortgages. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I started in student rental properties. They're some of the best cash flowing properties in my market. And uh -huh. so what you're able to do is take, you know, a five or six bedroom house. You maybe can buy it back then you could buy it for 250. Maybe now you'd be 350, but it would rent out for somewhere between 400 and say $550 a bedroom. And you know, you do that by five or six bedrooms and you have a really great cash flowing property. But the one thing is, uh, so when you buy, when you get these mortgages, of course you rent them out and you have a mortgage on that property itself. So let's say the rent you're getting in a thousand dollars, you have to pay back the bank around, let's just throw $700. So the difference is what you're talking about is what you put in your pocket of $300 profit. Am I right? Yeah. So essentially we use a handy rule of thumb called the 1% rule, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, but essentially for your viewers that maybe aren't real estate investors, the way the 1% rule works is if I buy a property for a hundred and thousand, say a hundred thousand dollars, I want to get at least a thousand dollars a month in rent from that property. Otherwise it's not a good investment. It won't cash flow well. And so what happens is in a hot market, a lot of real estate investors will get caught up chasing appreciation. Appreciation is great in a hot market, but if that market cools off or if it just continues too long on a bull market, you end up with like fundamentals that don't support actually investing in that real estate. And so I try and stay really grounded in the type of real estate I invest in. So cash flows king. Very, very nice. You said that very good. So right now, currently you have, uh, the, are they the same uh, things that you were renting out years ago? Are they the same uh, mortgages that you have right now? Have you upped and got more of those? Have you downgraded and sold out? What is it that you're doing right now? Sure. So uh, 2016, quit my day job. Essentially, I kind of went crazy then. I had so much free time that, uh, yeah. you know, I literally, I wasted probably a month or two just goofing around playing video games. But after that, I was hold like, up, hold up, hold up, Matt. What kind of video games do you play? Uh, strategy computer games. So like civilization. Please tell me, please tell me you played RuneScape. I, I actually haven't played RuneScape. No. <laughs> okay, you continue. Definitely huge on those 4X strategy games or uh, Explorer Conquer games. So have you got into 4X? Uh, trading? No. Uh, I think That's it's really, really risky in my opinion. Um, yeah, I think I lost around four thousand dollars in it, and I just said I'm out. I it was just a whole different ballpark, so I just lost that money, and I said I'm not going to continue it. Yeah, and so kind of even building off the idea of forex or stock investing or real estate, I think far too often I see people they see one YouTube video, they read one blog, they read one book, and they instantly think they're an expert. And so just for context, you know, I'm a CPA worked for five years public accounting, then worked for three years for a publicly traded pharmaceutical company as our sole financial controller. And what that meant was I was the guy that put our financial statements together. I was the guy that helped our CFO put together the MDNA analysis as wow. well as exposures. And all that being said, I would say I'm barely qualified to read financial statements. And what I mean by that is a lot of people think that they look at, you know, the balance sheet or the income statement or the cash flow of a publicly traded company and they think they understand the full picture. But there's so much more to it if you're actually going to be actively investing in stocks or real estate for that matter you actually need to become an expert or you need someone on your team that is an expert and so that's the reason i haven't invested in things like forex is because i know there's some insane amount of money going into algorithms and there's some of the smartest people in the world that are in, in charge of forex teams and i just don't see a competitive advantage for myself towards forex so very nicely said so basically you stay away from that what do you think about crypto because i see in your videos you got yourself a little uh bitcoin yeah. box I, <laughs> what's up with that see it. it's actually right there right beside me so that's oh, nice nice <laughs> cryptocurrency atm right there so long term 
I love blockchain. I'm all in on the concept of blockchain. I think it's the future. You know, I think it's going to be as disruptive as the internet was. So really love the idea of blockchain. That being said, 99% of the people investing in cryptocurrencies are actually just gambling. And there's nothing wrong with gambling with a little bit of your money as long as you're aware of it. But I think far too many people are allocating too large of a portion of their net worth towards cryptocurrencies, particularly without having read the white papers or understanding the fundamental technology. So yeah. I've been spending you know, the last year just trying to learn about blockchain. The reason I bought that ATM was more just to kind of put myself on the local cryptocurrency scene. So I host two different cryptocurrency meetups here in London, Ontario every month. And the reason every I do that, single month you do that. Yeah. And the reason wow. and one we do is like a high end one and one's kind of open to the public. And so the way we do that is everything's free, mind you, but the the open to the public one, people can show up. We get usually between 30 and say 50 people showing up to it. And then the people that are actually doing shit in the field, the guys and girls that are actually actively coding and actually actively day trading, we then invite them to a separate private like scotch tasting and kind of, you know, yeah, I understand. And again, this is just me trying to learn about cryptocurrency. I have no idea where it leads, but so far what it's led to is me meeting all kinds of interesting people taking on interesting projects. And I'm not going to become an expert in the technology or in the coding. So I need to meet programmers that are, if I'm ever going to get into that space in a big way. So that's kind of what I'm focused on in regards to cryptocurrency. Very nice. So basically you're you're in the real estate field, but you're getting your feet wet with the crypto world because you don't want to miss out on something that could be so big. And also you strongly believe in it. Now, one thing is, Matt, is there are so many methods that people use in, in the real estate world, right? There is people who wholesale, there's people who flip, there's people who do property development, who manage properties. There's so many things, but there's people who always say, I want to get into real estate but they don't specify into what exactly. And that's the problem that I start seeing with so many people as they think real estate is just real estate, but it has so much more involved within it. So for you as a real estate investor, what are the things that you focus on? Do you focus on wholesaling, on flipping, on renting? There's that the Burr method, right? Do you do that? Is that something that you're hot on? What is it that you do? Yeah, so great question. So I've kind of sampled a lot of the different investing strategies, but my bread and butter initially was student rentals. The reason I was focused on student rentals was to get cash flow. But the problem with the student rentals I was buying, uh, it was really tying up my money. So essentially, I could only acquire one per year in order. I couldn't save up more of a down payment. And so that needed, was what, what was your down payment needed? Five, 10, 15, 20 percent? So I was doing 20 percent down on my student rentals. And you know, being able to recycle your money can really speed up the velocity of it. And that's when I kind of stumbled upon the idea of burring. And so if you're not familiar with what a burr strategy is, it stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance and repeat. And so essentially at, to give a real simple explanation of how it works is I documented on my channel with a duplex I bought. So I bought this duplex for one hundred and ten thousand dollars. Then I put ten thousand dollars in what I call strategic renovations. And so those are renovations that really go far, but don't cost you a lot of money. So things I love to do are install dishwashers. So I can install a dishwasher, a used dishwasher that is, buy it for 50 or $100 on Craigslist or Kijiji, get it installed, maybe be about $250 all in on this dishwasher. Uh -huh. And I can increase the rents per unit by $50 for that dishwasher. So you're talking about a payback period of like five months. That is so smart. So that's that's why you emphasize on strategical rehab, strategical fixing up. It's not people go in and put floors and put paint and put all these top graded uh, fixtures and so forth. That's not strategical. They're just trying to make it fancy. But when you're renting, you try to invest as little money as you can. But what you invest in is things that bring back a return a lot quicker, like a dishwasher. That's a smart way to look at it. Nice. Absolutely. And another big tip is uh, laundry. And so I love installing used laundry as well. Often it'll be under a thousand dollars all in to install laundry in a unit that's never had laundry before. And again, I can often increase rent somewhere between 75 and $150 a month, just depending on the exact details and the nature of that unit. And the thing, a lot of people think about, oh, hey, that's great. You're making more money, blah, blah, blah. But what it's also doing is it's increasing the profile, the quality profile of your tenant, if you think about it. you know. If you're looking to rent a place, do you want a dishwasher? Do you want laundry? 
And the answer is usually yes. And you probably consider yourself an above average tenant. So if you're going to try and attract above average tenant, you need to focus on what those tenants want. Wow, you said that so nice. Above average tenants. Because I did renting, uh, Matt, I did renting a property one time. Never again have I rented a property. Uh, it was hell for me, right? Dude, I saw I, that video. It looked crazy. I'm almost yeah. positive that I see that video. It, you put it on social media, right? Yes, and it was hell. It was a whole different game for me. First time doing it. Don't get it twisted. My my tenants were excellent, but there were so many issues that went in it that I was like, what is the point of renting a property, right? But you have to remember, Matt, I'm paying for these properties cash. So if you're going through the bank, it makes a whole different it's a whole different ballpark if you're going through the bank for it or if you're buying it cash. So buying it cash, you can buy probably five properties on a uh, mortgage. But what I was doing was actually buying it cash, which is yeah. not the right way to do it when you're trying to rent. And that's what I experienced when I was doing it. Yeah. So uh, maybe to circle back. So my example for the burn investing strategy, buy for say 110,000, this little duplex, spend 10,000 on strategic renovations. And what that did was that unit used to rent out for 1100 gross rent. By the time I was done, I was able to increase that gross rent to uh, 1600, I think it was. And so essentially because you've increased the rent so much, because you've made the property look nicer, you can then go to the bank and say, Hey, Mr. Banker, check out my property. It's making more money. It's in way better condition. Do you think is it worth more? They'll send out an appraiser. The appraiser will, assuming you did your work right, agree with you. Then you'll be able to borrow against the new equity you created, the forced equity you created by those strategic renovations. And so in my example, what that looks like is essentially we bought for 110, put 10,000 renovations. The bank came back, said it's worth 150,000. Wow. So we can get a new 80% loan to value, which means a new mortgage for 120. So we bought the property for 110, put 10,000 in, new mortgage for 120. What that means is by the time we refinance, we're only out of pocket our holding and closing costs, which means that this property cost me like three grand, but it's putting about $500 a month cash flow into my pocket every month. So, so especially going to pay for itself in under a year. So that is that is amazing. So you took it from 11. So let's just recap over $110,000. You put in 10,000. So it became $120,000. And then you ended up going to the bank and they came and appraised it at 150K. So you have a 30,000 um, margin basically in equity. And your closing cost, like you said, was the only thing that really costed you. So around two, $3,000, let's say. Yes, exactly. And so actually funny story is, uh, I sold that property earlier this year and I ended up selling it for uh, 190. So the bank was actually kind of low on their estimate, but uh, so yeah. That's 90. Yeah, I held the property for about a year and a half, um, which is useful for capital gains reasons. I was about to ask you that. Did you have to, so you didn't have to pay capital gains, right? Uh, yes, because we don't have what's called the 10, you guys have the 1031 exchange. I'm so jealous of my American friends because <laughs> you guys have that extremely powerful investment tool. We don't have that in Canada. Oh my God. You guys don't have that. No, man. I'm so now, jealous. How is, how is your taxes there though? For us, we have not super high taxes, but they're high. Yeah. So, uh, in Canada, the way it's going to work, you know, we, we are a higher tax jurisdiction. So essentially on your capital gains, the way capital gains taxes work are you pay your tax on 50% of your capital gain. So if you had a gain of a hundred thousand, you're going to be taxed on 50,000 of it. And essentially if you're in the highest tax bracket, it's about 50%. So essentially on a hundred thousand dollar capital gains, you'd expect to pay $25,000 in taxes in my jurisdiction. So you, it's around 25%, you could say, yeah, around 25% off of a hundred thousand. Yeah. So that's kind of what you're looking at. So, you know, that's not terribly detrimental to building up a flipping business, but or a flipping or say an upgrading rental business. But the idea of being able to do 1031 exchanges, even if that's not the, the only strategy you're using, it's a fantastic tool in your toolbox. Can you, uh, so I know, can you give the audience what a 1031 is in a nutshell, just real quick, what it is, because that's a huge tool that we have that you don't have that you wish you yeah. had. So I want them to kind of feel for it on why you're saying it's such a good tool. For sure. And so obviously I'm not an expert on 1031s because we don't even have them in Canada, but <laughs> the 
and I've done a video on it, but it's been a while since I did the video. But essentially, the gist of it is, is you can have a rental property or an investment property in the U.S. And there's certain restrictions and you need to read the exact details. But as long as you hold it for a certain period of time, then when you go to sell it, you can take the proceeds from that sale, reinvest it into a new property and you're essentially deferring the taxes. And my understanding is correct. You could essentially infinitely defer them until your death. And that just yeah, really right. again, speeds up the velocity of your money. And if you remember, the reason I got into burn investing was because I was trying to focus on speeding up the velocity of money. How fast can I turn this money over? And not paying taxes is a great way to give you more money to roll over. You said it perfectly. And that's exactly what it is now. One thing that I always I have a confusion on regarding the 1031 exchange is you can never really pull out your profits until like basically if you ever do 1031 exchange you have to keep reinvesting it including your profits as well otherwise you're gonna have to pay taxes on it so for those who want to just keep building up their money and never actually pull it out until a certain age it's excellent but if you ever want to pull it out you're still gonna have to pay the taxes on it but of course it's not going to be capital gains such high taxes because you've held it for such a long time yeah, hundred percent. And the only other thing to kind of take into consideration about that, some people might be thinking right now, Hey, I want to get access to that money because I want to go spend it. One, don't spend your money. But two, <laughs> the thing is if you're investing and you're rolling your money over through these 1031 exchanges, if you're rolling them over into bigger, larger cash flowing properties, you could live off the cash flow, And that's essentially how you can get access to some of those profits, if you will. Definitely. You said it best. So we spoke about right now on this live stream, what we spoke about is how you got into real estate, how you started as a CPA. So of course you went to school, right? How was your experience with the school life? And did you always have in your mind real estate? Did you always want to get into that? And why did you study CPA? Yeah. So essentially, you know, I became a CPA simply because I didn't know what else to become. I wanted, you know, I was raised in a very scarcity oriented family you know the idea of just go get a good white collar job you know work for 30 40 50 years then retire get a good pension and just you know rinse and repeat i was the first person in my family to ever go to university all wow. that stuff. and so essentially there was like certain expectations right on what i should do when i was going to university and what i should become and you know, again, thankfully, business or accounting is just a great foundation, particularly if you're entrepreneurial oriented. And I was so I was able to take that and just use that as a foundation. And so because I was going to business school, I met a lot of other like minded individuals. One of them introduced me. Actually, his dad introduced me to the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then essentially, once I went down that rabbit hole, you know, I read The Millionaire Next Door, uh, The Wealthy Barber all the, your money, your life, all those different fantastic yeah. personal finance books. And uh, I just realized that real estate at the end of the day, it's been around for a very long time. If you want to think about it and then reframe it in a slightly different way, think about it this way, you know, kings, emperors, ev all, all these different people were actually just kind of land barons or landlords, you know, a fiefdom, literally that's what a king has or a kingdom that's really just a collection of land. That's someone that controls that land. A thief is a, a piece of land. So yeah. I think that that's something really important to realize that real estate's like, essentially what real estate is, is you're just controlling a productive asset and then you're able to use that productive asset to whatever means or end. And the thing is this type of productive asset, we haven't seen it um, become obsolete as fast as perhaps other types of investments or other types of productive assets. Definitely. And for me, like you said, real estate is such a hot thing, not only today, but it was years and years ago. But one thing Matt, that really scares me, I'm just going to say it out there is the market has been so bullish 10, 11 years. I'm afraid that at one random day we wake up and the market just starts to get hit hard. Now, the recession that happened in 2008 and 2009, some people say that it's not going to be hit as hard. Some people say it's going to retrace a little bit, but it's not going to be like 08 and 09. But a lot of things that I see right now in this bullish market get me some fear in my system because when I want to go invest, but I see that the market has been so hot for so long, I'm scared to keep my money in too long because I don't want it to get basically wiped down if the market did crash. What do you have to say about the market being so hot? And do you see a potential retrace, a minimal one or a major one coming up very soon? 
Yeah, so obviously that's a big question, and it's a question that's on a lot of Canadians' mindsets in particular, because at least in the U.S., you guys saw a major pullback in your real estate market, uh, where we did not experience that in Canada. Mind you, we did not have the same buildup in the early 2000s that you guys did in your real estate market. Yeah. So all that being said, I think it really comes down to the number one rule in real estate is location, location, location. And what that means to me is real estate's hyper-localized. So what may work in one market may not work in the others. So for example, in my market, and I'll talk about my market because it's the area I'm the biggest expert in, London, Ontario, uh, we have not seen appreciation until around 2016. Essentially, you could have bought a property in 2015 for approximately the same price as you could have bought it for in say 2002. So oh, we, did wow. not, we did not see significant increase in appreciation. Essentially, the first, properties I bought in 2010, I saw zero appreciation until 2015. So what's been going on in my market is very recently, the last two years, we've seen a major ramp up. Whereas in other areas in Canada, Toronto and Vancouver in particular, they've seen massive gains for the last five, 10 years in the real estate market. So in my market, personally, I'm not overly concerned about correction. And the way that I'm able to rationalize or justify my lack of fear towards a correction is based off of this. I'm focusing on investing in cash flow. So the properties I'm investing in are meeting that 1% rule. And what that means is I could probably handle about a 30% correction in rent prices before I would be break even on my cash flow. So what that means is rent wow. prices would actually have to drop by 30%. Now, real estate prices can drop by 30% overnight in certain markets. But rent prices, rent prices are actually far more stable, at least particularly in my market. It's very rare to see a pullback. We might see a plateau where it hits a certain, you know, a certain price point or a certain ceiling. It might stay there for a few years, but it's really rare to actually see a decrease in rent prices. So that's kind of my sleep at night factor as well. I have at least 20 percent equity in all my properties. So, again, before I end up underwater on any one of my properties, I'd have to take at least a 20 percent haircut. And I don't want to take a 20% haircut on my <laughs> equity, but as long as my properties are cash flowing, I can essentially survive that indefinitely. So other investors that are focused on appreciation plays and solely appreciation plays, I think that they do have greater reason for concern if there is, say, a correction in the market. Whereas us cash flow investors, honestly, we're just we're there for the cash flow. The cash flow is dependent on the rent prices. So barring a major correction in rent prices, there's no reason to fear. I see what you're saying 100%. You you said that real nice and it made me think for a second because if you're renting, then it's a whole different game actually than if you're flipping because renting those, everybody always needs what on their head, Matt. Everybody always needs that roof. So if people live in houses and they lose those houses to the banks because the market just crashed, they're going to all flock so they can rent because that's what they need over their heads. So, and also don't forget you're buying these mute this real quick you're buying these properties at a lower price if i'm not mistaken correct so you're not entering them at retail price right yes so uh particularly in the hot real estate market like it is in london ontario or like in your market in texas uh finding private deals is the best way so a lot of real estate investors and myself i agree with this will tell you you make your money on the buy not on the sell and so what they mean by making money on the buy is you need to be buying the property and essentially, uh, there's some confusion lately. Recently, you know, me and Meet Kevin, uh, who is another YouTuber, I've had a bit of a. I, I, I love that video. I, <laughs> I love I, that. I love Meet Kevin, and he's hilarious, but he's got a certain perspective on wholesaling real estate or finding private deals. And it's very colored by the fact that he's a realtor. And so I completely understand it. First things first, he's an amazing realtor. But what you need to understand about private deals or wholesaling is it comes down to information asymmetry. And a lot of people get caught up in this idea for whatever reason when it comes to real estate that information asymmetry is amoral or unethical. Whereas information asymmetry when it comes to your lawyer or your accountant, you have no problem with the fact that your lawyer won't just tell you what law you're breaking or what sort of contract you need. You're used to paying them for that information asymmetry, the fact that they're an expert in some hyper localized niche of information. And that's what real estate investing is as well. So we really focus on private deals and the way we're getting private deals are by doing the we buy houses sign, sending out flyers. You know, we sent out 40,000 flyers uh, oh two weeks ago. And so, you know, we're looking to put out about between 10 and 20,000 flyers a week on average. And we're actively 
getting more people working for us as wholesalers because yeah, it comes down to that information asymmetry. If you can buy a property and buy it for say 60 or 70 cents of the ARB price, it gives you a much better advantage than if you have to compete on the MLS or Realtor.ca as we call it in Canada. And you have to compete with every investor that can be exposed to that deal. As well, you know, these private deals that we're buying, they are complicated. So often they're properties that the realtors came look at and told the seller like, oh, it'll never sell because of this, that, or the other, you know, huge problems. Often they're properties that maybe you do have to buy in cash, but with that, it reduces the entire buyer pool, which means that you're, there's less competition, which means there's greater opportunity again for greater information asymmetry. So yeah, all about private deals right now. I think the best way to find private deals are knocking on doors. So that's literally, you just go knock on distressed doors, introduce yourself, say, hey, my name's Matt. I've been looking to buy a house in your neighborhood. Uh, I haven't seen anything on the MLS. Do you know of anyone that's thinking about selling? And just starting a dialogue with them. You don't that's want to- Door knocking, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is door knocking as well as flyers. Flyers are fantastic, fantastic, option if say you have a little bit of money but you have less time than door knocking you can door knock if you have zero dollars all you need to do is get to that neighborhood and start knocking on doors if you're going to go the flyer approach you know you may be it's going to cost you about 25 cents per household and we found that on average about a thousand flyers should result in at least a handful of opportunities and if you're good you'll be able to convert to at least on one of those opportunities man that's that's so Matt, what you just said is something that you can't just get from, from reading or from watching or any of that. What you just said is from personal, real experience. You said a thousand flyers can get you a handful of opportunities. So the ones who are listening right now, I want you to focus on those words that he's saying because he's not just sharing with you numbers and things, but he's sharing facts. So you pass out a thousand flyers, you can potentially get a handful of opportunities that can lead to a potential purchase. I myself, I went knocking on Probably it was around 15 apartment complexes, door to door, stairs to stairs. And all of these generated so much leads for me on people who were in those apartment complexes who wanted to move out to purchase a house. So instead of using a realtor, I would go manually knocking on these doors and calling those renters into a house purchase. Now, this isn't something you can scale so much with because it's a lot of effort. But when you start off and you don't want to pay that realtor fee of 3%, then you can do something like that and even six percent if you can save it from the other side so matt what you said right there is is valuable and i want people to appreciate what you just put out there and i appreciate that myself because that's knowledge okay. i can take home so yeah so maybe actually just to kind of reframe this a little bit better for your audience so if you guys are young if you're young and hungry but you have no money we found that a hundred targeted door knocks usually results in three opportunities and if you're, if you're good, you're going to be able to convert all three of those opportunities. The average opportunity for us, you know, on that hundred door knocks or that thousand flyers, the way those opportunities look is one can probably be a referral to a realtor. Off that referral, you'll maybe make 500 to $1,500. The other might be what we call a wholetail. Off that wholetail, you'll probably make somewhere between three and $5,000. The third opportunity probably will be a wholesale. This is your bread and butter. And off that, again, if, if you got a little bit of experience, you should be able to make $10,000 off that wholesale in my market. So essentially door knocking free. All you need to do is spend your time and effort. The flyers, we're spending about 25 cents per household. So that's about $250 for a thousand flyers. And if we're able to get a $1,500 profit margin, a $5,000 profit center and a $10,000 profit center, you can see the returns there are fantastic if you're willing to put in the effort. Very nice. Now we have someone who just asked a question, Matt. He said, do you wholesale? And if so, what is your best strategy? So yeah, so right now in Canada, flyers, uh, direct mail is by far the most powerful strategy. I know in a lot of US cities, a lot of my US counterparts are telling me it's it's way more competitive. You know, you guys got the signs everywhere saying we buy houses. <laughs> yeah, um, we have I, I saw recently there's one that says we buy horses. <laughs> any mission, fast close cash. And so the fact that you guys, and like, I've literally seen the wholesale signs where it's like, we buy houses. Someone puts down a sign that says we buy houses for more. And another person says me too. Like it yeah, is they crazy. crazy. They go crazy, yeah. man. You see them on every side of the road. So like that, that's not the case in Canada. So if you're in a market that's still kind of green pastures, go with door knocking and uh, 
direct mail or flyers. Beyond that, bandit signs can be really useful. Obviously, there's a reason they're called bandit signs. So you might want to get comfortable with uh, what the potential consequences are with your local bylaw or municipality before you start doing bandit signs. But what bandit signs are, they're the signs that we were joking about earlier, where you just stick it in the ground and says, we buy houses, yeah. you put it on a telephone pole or something to that effect. But beyond that, networking. Networking is the fastest way to both scale up your opportunities as well as just scale up your your network and your ability to grow. Uh, there's no sense reinventing the wheel. For the longest time, I was focused on being a lone wolf. And it was really important to me that I'd be able to brag and show everyone how smart and clever I was because I did completely by myself. You know, with teamwork, you can grow so much better, bigger, stronger, and in different ways than you'd expect. So networking is fantastic and in particular strategic networking. So if you're looking for private real estate deals, network with property managers, network with people that see problem properties. So think about that. That's people like exterminators or sheriffs that are evicting people. And, you know, your local bylaw officer that's constantly flagging this property or that property for noise violations or, you know, whatever the case is, parking infractions. And then focus on those opportunities because a problem is really just an opportunity in disguise. So myself and my uh, real estate uh, agent, Jeff Weibel, we constantly talk about uh, profits or problems. You get to decide what they are, but they're both they're the exact same thing. Very nice, Matt. You said that very good. So you've uh, been in the scene of wholesaling and only I wanted to ask you real quick. So you're very bullish on networking. Is that why you believe you make these events? Because you made OREC, which is a real estate meetup. You do a lot of crypto meetups. So are you bullish on these? Because you believe these networks build you a lot more opportunity. Yes, 100 percent agree with that. And so actually, before this video started, we were chatting and I'd mentioned Gary V has what he calls the uh, the high school party rule. And so what that high school party rule is, how that works simply is if you're in high school and you're not cool, you throw the party and you instantly become cool. You become the center. Matt, if you could, if you, Matt, if you don't mind, if you can repeat that, I think it froze real quick. If you oh, can just say that. No worries. So Gary Vee has what he calls the high school rule. And so what that means is if you're not cool, if you're not popular, you throw the party in high school and you become the center, you become the hub. Instantly, all the cool people come to you, and by them coming to you, you become cool by association. You essentially get the benefits of that social capital by having them come into your influence. And so that's what we're doing with networking. It's the reason that tomorrow we have what's called the Weibo Limo Tour. And what that is is we rent a limo bus and we check out you know, 8 to 12 uh, potential income properties, myself and my realtor, Jeff Weibel, and we take you know 10 to 20, sometimes 30 other investors and we all just hang out and it's just a party and an opportunity to get to meet interesting people. And the funny thing is, oh, go ahead. You guys make real estate fun. I just want to point that in there. You guys yeah. make it fun. Yeah, we're focused on doing things differently. We're focused on constantly experimenting. We don't want to be fighting last year's war. We want to be looking ahead. We want to be on the cutting edge. And so I think networking is the one area that if you, you have zero competitive advantage, focus on creating a network. Because number one, it costs next to nothing to create that network. You know, find a local bar or library or a meeting space, a hall, whatever it is. Plant the flag and become the center, become the hub. It's similar to what uh, Gary Vee again did with, he started up like a voice convention, voice con or whatever it was. And he said he just wanted to be the center, he wanted to be the hub. And so that's the reason that I'm doing my cryptocurrency meetups or my blockchain meetups is because I want to be the hub because I have zero competitive advantage. So there's zero reason to think that I'm going to succeed in the blockchain or cryptocurrency world without getting fantastic team members on my team. And the best way for me to do that is by drawing them into my circle. So that's why I'm so big on networking. And I just I think far too many people don't realize that once you plant that flag as being the expert or the center, everyone comes to you with their problems. And as I mentioned earlier, problems are just an opportunity to profit. So they're going to come up to you and they're going to be like, oh, man, like geez, I got closed on this property tomorrow and I need $100,000 in cash. I honestly, I would pay like 20% for one month if people would just like, I can't lose this deal, man, because I'm going to make 100K on it. And you're like, oh shit, man. Like, yeah, I'll step in. Like, I'll, I'll help you find that 100K. Maybe you lend it to them or maybe you just be the middleman and introduce them to the right person and you get a tiny cut. And the thing is, I love waiting forever to make an ask. So like, Myself and Jeff Weibel, we purposely avoid monetizing everything for as long as possible. We kind of joke, monetize when it's painful. 
So the moment that we're losing too much money on something is when we'll flip the monetization flitch or switch because up until that point, we're just focused on if it's not losing us a lot of money, if it can be self-sustaining, that's a net win because we're getting all this free attention and we're all about getting attention. Very, very nice. Now we have Ty asked us one more time. He asked a different question now. What percentage of the deal would you give an agent if they help you find these properties? Now, typically it's a 3% payout to these uh, realtors, but if they help you find these wholesale properties, what's a percentage you would give? And is this something that depends on how much uh, margins you're getting or what's your take on that? Yeah, so that's a good question. And it's kind of, it's at least a mildly complicated question. The reason for that is, you know, the realtor may have a fiduciary duty if they're how can you find that private deal so that's something that the realtor is going to have to be hyper aware of so uh with that in context assuming in canada it's the difference between a client and a customer so assuming that they're only dealing with a customer they don't have a fiduciary duty if they're dealing with a client they do so if they're dealing with a client they honestly probably shouldn't be finding you a wholesale deal because they have a fiduciary duty to that to the seller so they're not going to be able to look out for your best interest as the buyer or the wholesaler but that being said we get tons of referrals and the biggest thing we do is with property managers and exterminators usually but we give them what's called a bird dog fee and what a bird dog fee is it's really just if we close on the deal or one of our partners close on the deal we usually pay between a 500 and two thousand dollar fee and so if you think about it if our wholesale fees usually around $10,000, then we're talking about five to 20% of what we make is what we're willing to give someone, literally just for giving us the opportunity. So they're not giving us a piece of paper yet. They're literally just being like, hey, here's Joe, the landlord's phone number. I think he may want to sell. And then we call up Joe and we say, hey, Joe, what's going on? Heard you own 123 Fake Street. Tell me a little bit more about the property. Oh, cool, that's interesting. Oh man, that's, that's terrible that you got that terrible tenant. Have you started evicting them? Oh, you don't know how to evict them. Well, we could definitely help you out with evicting them if you want. Oh, you just want to sell the property tomorrow because you're just sick of it and money's not the most important thing. Okay, cool. Like we can do that too. We buy houses cash. And then essentially if we go and buy that property or we wholesale to someone, that's where they get that finder's fee. So yeah. a realtor, sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced. You might end up giving them up to 50% of the deal. I think the problem I see with far too many real estate investors or just business people in general when they get started is they're so scarcity oriented. They're focused on making sure that they get as much money as possible out of that first deal. Wow. I'm focused on making sure I get as much social capital as possible out of that first deal. What so do you mean I, by social capital, Matt? So essentially the very first wholesale deal we did through my like wholesale business, we purposely gave an insane deal to someone. So what it was, we found a student rental property in one of my markets that I totally wanted to buy, but I knew it was such a good opportunity that we wanted to videotape the whole process so that we could document the sort of deals we're able to provide as a wholesaler. So essentially the way this deal worked was we got the property under contract for 212. We sold it to the, uh, or we wholesaled it to the end buyer for 230. So essentially we had an $18,000 wholesale fee there. But he went through and had the bank appraise it and they appraised it at 305 and as is condition. Wow. So he essentially walked into what did that work out to like 70 grand and almost 70 grand or 75 grand in uh, equity overnight. And so, you know, a lot of wholesalers would have maybe tried to have made double the wholesale fee off of that. But then all of a sudden, maybe it was going to be less of a sexy deal or they might have kept that deal for themselves because they would have been greedy. But uh -huh. the thing is, we wanted to show that. No, we are giving value by wholesaling these deals. We are really giving opportunities. We're not just eating all the best meals and then you guys are getting the crumbs from us. Yeah. So, you know, we made sure that we were creating a fan. And so it's something I've been talking about recently. A lot of businesses, this idea of a customer versus a fan. I want a fan because a fan's fanatical. A fan will stand in line to buy your product or stand in line to support you. A customer, a customer is going to try and negotiate with you on terms. I want fans, not customers. And even in our wholesale business, we're focused on creating fans, people that trust us. They say, hey, are you telling me this is a good deal? And we say, yes, it's a good deal. And then we have that sort of relationship and that sort of trust where we're not going to have to spend two weeks of due diligence in order for them to say yes and buy this wholesale deal.
Yep, you're building that relationship ahead of time, and I love that. Now, there's uh, two points that I want to touch up on real quick. A quick answer to Ty Speaks, who actually gave that question. What I did is uh, my realtor actually found me a great opportunity, a great flip, and I actually give her usually 2% of the commission. And it depends really. Some realtors, I give them 3%, some 2%, some 1.5%. But you do your negotiations accordingly, but you're, you're going to typically start at 3%. On this deal, I gave a full 3% because the opportunity was brung to me from that end, from that realtor's end. And it came out to around $5,000 is what I gave that realtor just for finding me that deal. So like Matt was saying, don't be greedy with what you do. Feed the people who are on your team because you are not going to grow on your own. You got to build that team around you in order to get to the next level. So that's something that I would uh, answer you on that question that you had. Now, Matt, we had a great discussion basically speaking about how you got into real estate, how you first started in your life as you finished becoming a CPA, how you left your job to go full time in real estate. And then we started discussing on the Burr method. We started discussing on wholesaling and so forth. And I feel like we gave a lot of value to the audience and you bring a lot to the table, sharing your information and your insight with that. So I wanted to thank you so much for coming out and doing just that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's no problem, brother. I appreciate you being on the show. Now we passed around 45 minutes, so I'm going to call it a show right now, call it an end. So thank you all so much for watching, kicking it with Kerem. This is the first live stream. We have our special guest, Matt McKeever coming, who gave us some great insight on the real estate aspect. He is from London, Ontario, and he delivered some great gems. Once again, thank you so much. The live stream is going to be end right now. We're going to end that live stream right now. So you all have a great one and we'll see you on the next one for right now. Me and Matt are out. Thanks, guys. Smash that like button. There you go. <laughs>